All right. Record. Okay, Mr. Mayor, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. I'd like to call a regular meeting Rampart Town Council for March 14th, 22nd, 2022, 6.30 p.m. to order, please. Roll call. <clears throat> Councillor McGee? Here. Councillor Toner? Councillor Burnett? Here. Councillor Grinstead? Here. Councillor Strike? Here. County Councillor Lynch? Here. And Mayor Stack? Here. Thank you. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we work and gather is a traditional unceded territory of the Anishwa Bay people. This Algonquin nation have lived in this land for thousands of years long before the arrival of the European settlers. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory. You have the adoption of the agenda, please. The result of the agenda for the regular meeting of council dated Monday, March 14th, 2022 be adopted. Mover and seconder, please. Ted, Lynn, any comments? All in favor? Carried. Yeah. Do you have any disclosure of pecuniary interests? Seeing none. Any questions on previous council business? Not currently seeing any hands raised, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. We have adoption of the minutes, please. That the minutes of the regular meeting of council listed under item 7A on the agenda be adopted. Mover and seconder, please. Lisa, Lynn, any comments? No, all in favor, please. Carried, thank you. So awards and delegations. We have an award tonight. Uh, we have one of our recreation staff here Rick from the, uh, the pool after 32 years, Rick is retired. So we're gonna bring him in. And there's Chris joining us, yeah. Good evening. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm gonna start. Rick has dedicated 32 years of service to the town of Iron Prior and its recreation department. Started with the town as an aquatic instructor in 1989, helping support and deliver the ever important life skill of swimming, the benefits of aquatic fitness and swimming supporting one's health, and of course, the fun that can be had in the water. There are countless members <clears throat> of this community that can say Rick taught them how to swim and helped keep them fit mm -hmm. and have fun in the pool. After 24 years in the pool, Rick accepted a role as a recreation program coordinator, where he continued his dedication to enhancing the physical, social, and mental well being of the community by developing and running various, a variety of camps, programs, and events for youth, adults, seniors, and families. In addition to the community benefiting from the programming that Rick established, many staff also profited from Rick's guidance, leadership, and passion. For 33 years, people felt welcome at the Nick Smith Center because Rick. Because of Rick, he had a strong rapport with both the staff and patrons, which was seen in, that, <clears throat> in the chats that he shared with them and the laughter you could often hear. Many lifelong friendships have come from these connections at the Nick Smith Center. To the town of Iron Pirates, residents and visitors are great, grateful for the passion and energy that Rick brought to the job every day for over 32 years. And we're here tonight to congratulate Rick on his retirement. And Robin and Rena and I met with Rick this morning in the uh, council chambers and presented him with his uh, gift. And uh, I'll open it now to council for comments. Okay, Lynn. So I just wanna say congratulations, Rick, and thank you for the many years of service. I know far long before I was a counselor, you and I knew each other because Rick was instrumental in all four of my children learning how to swim. And his, um, his, uh, at charisma and attitude with children was is incredible and was incredible and I know my kids had lasting memories of that so thank you Rick for all you've done for our recreation department thanks Lynn <clears throat> Dan yeah thank you Mr. Mayor uh, 
Rick, it's not the swimming I'm thanking you for because we don't swim. But I will say thank you from the Renfrew County Senior Games for the number of years you helped me with the carpet bowling that was we hosted here in Armpire. You did a fantastic job making it go. And uh, on behalf of the county, thank you very much. Best of luck. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Dan, I thought you were going to comment on the Christmas suit competition. <laughs> <laughs> but he's no longer with the town, so I'm safe. <laughs> the Ted, yep. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Rick, we've known each other from day one. Goes back a long way. Uh, congratulations on your retirement. Enjoy the days you have remaining. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, hi, uh, Rick. Yes, uh, congratulations on your um, retirement. Uh, it was always a pleasure walking into the Nick Smith Center. You have a, a very friendly and um, contagious smile. It's uh, it, it, it was it was always fantastic. Um, you know, I think my kids and uh, you knew my wife, uh, Vicky, from uh, her days teaching and bringing her kids there. And I just want to say congratulations once again. And uh, I hope you have a great uh, retirement and I get to do all the wonderful things that uh, you have planned. So congratulations once again. <clears throat> Thanks, Chris. Any comments maybe from the CAO or anybody want to? I think uh, Rick wanted to say a few words. Yeah. I, was I do. You don't the mind. Yeah. No, I was leaving you for the wrap up, Rick. But, but Mr. Mayor, can we get on with the roast now? <laughs> <laughs> I get to start. All right, I'll keep this short. Mayor Stack, members of council and staff, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for the gift and the acknowledgement honoring my recent retirement. It's shocking to me, honestly, to think that 32 years have passed since I began working for the town, but the dates on the calendar don't lie, nor does my birth certificate. As I reflect back upon my career, I would like to take this opportunity to publicly thank a few people who had a hand in making these last 32 years working for the town so worthwhile and so rewarding. To Glenn Arthur, uh, thank you Glenn for giving a 22 year old kid fresh out of college the opportunity for his first full-time job. Glenn's support and encouragement over the years combined with his dedication to top-notch community service, programming and special events were instrumental to me as I developed and evolved as a recreation professional. Thanks Glenn for your example and for your unwavering support. To Jay Kosh, Jay and I have worked together since 1998, however more closely beginning in 2013 when I moved from my position in the pool to the role of Recreation Program Coordinator. <clears throat> With Jay's encouragement and mentoring leadership, he provided ongoing guidance, support and feedback to me from which we built a solid and respected Recreation Programming Partnership. Our partnership soon became a friendship that I will cherish for life. To my sisters in the pool, Debbie Jebo, Krista Jeffries, Jane Dowd, thank you three ladies for making work never dull or never boring. You've been there through life's ups and downs, providing your friendship, support, best of all, your laughter. And I'm grateful for the years that we've had worked, we have worked together. To our front office staff, uh, Karen McLaughlin, Tracy McRae, Don Harvey, Brenda, Brenda Murdoch, Hazel Power, you ladies are truly the oil that keeps the squeaky wheel at the Nick Smith Center running so smoothly. Your ongoing support, assistance, and friendships during these years is very appreciated. I'd also like to wish the countless numbers of patrons I've interacted with over the years, and especially those regulars who attended weekly and often daily to their activities. Many of those clients have been there since my start, and I've been able to foster many close friendships with clients over the years, and I am thankful to those that have cheered me on. I suppose I can't sign off without acknowledging my family, um, my lovely wife, Lisa, our children. You guys uh, are the reason I got up and went to work every day for 32 years. Uh, your love and support and encouragement is um, kind of the best, and, and I'm very appreciative of that. And in closing, uh, while the last two years have been challenging for the staff and the patrons at the Nick Smith Center, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has impacted everyone. However, 
as things finally appear to be improving, I am hopeful that the recreation team will once again have things back to full swing and the Nick Smith Center will be that hustling and bustling community center it is meant to be. I want to thank you all again for your time this evening and thank you for this lovely acknowledgement. All the best. Thanks very much, Rick, and good luck. Thank you. Retirement. And if you have an extra ticket and some of those trips you're planning. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, once it's safe to do so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a good night. And thank you again, everyone. Thanks, Rick. Okay. We have no public meetings or matters tabled or deferred We're into staff reports. And the first one is Marshall Bay. Yes, sorry, Mr. Mayor, I was just moving people around. Yeah. Um, that council approve a request from Marshalls Bay Regional Inc. to allow for earthworks, rock blasting, and construction of access road on the land subject to subdivision application 47T14002, Marshalls Bay Meadows Phase 3, 4A, and 4B, subject to the requirements outlined in this report. Move and seconder, please. Lisa, or Lynn and uh, Dan. Yeah. Okay, John. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Sack. Um, good evening, everyone. This report is fairly straightforward. We've seen a few of them before uh, over the years from various developments, including this uh, this development phase one and two went through a similar process. Um, so where we're at with phases three, four A and four B, um, which will be the majority of the remainder of the Marshalls Bay subdivision, there is one further phase five uh, that will come forward at a later date. Um, but the developer at this point is working uh, with their engineering firm and staff uh, going through the detailed design engineering. They have made their first submission and we provided comments back to them just in the last week uh, with respect to the, uh, to the infrastructure and uh, subdivision design plans. So uh, they're hopeful that they will be in a position to submit for ECA approvals from the Ministry of Environment uh, in the coming weeks ahead. Uh, but in the meantime, they are looking to continue to progress with some of the earthworks, uh, rock blasting, as well as staff have, uh, have requested that a construction access road be built into these additional phases to minimize the amount of construction traffic traveling through uh, phases one and two, which are now quite heavily occupied uh, with residents. So that will form part of the scope of the work here as well. Um, so the developer has posted uh, the necessary securities, insurance certificates, uh, and letter of indemnification as we typically require for this type of application. Um, other than that, it's fairly straightforward, but I will open it up to council for any questions you may have. Okay, any comments or questions? Dan? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. John, is there any soil, that new soil thing that came out on the 1st of January, is there any soil remove, uh, being removed from the site with the blasting? Um, the majority of, the, of this site is actually, uh, they're actually looking for soil. So they've actually brought in some soil from, from other locations previously. Uh, I can tell you that they are uh, adhering to the new uh, ministry regulations and their consultants, consulting engineers have been following those requirements for sampling and testing. Um, so, so that is all in hand uh, by the development uh, developer and their engineering firm. Thank you. Okay. No one else? All in favor then, please? Carried, thank you. The next one is the emergency management program. Yeah. Yes, sorry, Mr. Mayor. The council amend, I'm oh, sorry, amend appendix C of bylaw 619013 as amended to remove item goal number five, appointing the operations advisory committee to act as the town's emergency management program committee. And further, that council enacts a bylaw to appoint the following personnel as the town's emergency management program committee, as prescribed within Ontario Regulation 38004, and the council approved emergency plan. Community Emergency Management Coordinator, Chair, Deputy Fire Chief, Head of Council, EOC Commander, Chief Administrative Officer, Operations Sector Chief, Fire Chief, Planning Sector Chief, Town Clerk, Logistics Section Chief, General Manager of Operations and Finance Section Chief, General Manager of Client Services Treasurer. Okay, mover and seconder, please. Chris and Dan and Corey's up. Yes. Sorry, you Corey, did, you're on mute. Muted, Corey. 
Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Okay, yeah. perfect. Great. So essentially the, the report that uh, sits before you tonight is to restructure the Emergency Management Program Committee back to its original format, uh, which is more closely in line with Ontario Regulation 380.04. The rationale being that um, the council-based committees, um, however well intended, they do follow uh, council cycles and, and oftentimes um, they can lead to compressed timelines. For example, this year, the council committees are only meeting twice. Uh, last year, we ran into some compliance um, uh, difficulties because the council committee meetings were, were, were uh, can canceled all, all together. Uh, this way, reverting back to the to the old format that aligns more closely with the regulation, we'll still be able to fill all those compliance objectives, and we're also not bound to uh, committee um, meeting cycles. So staff are able to meet freely as situations evolve and change, as they typically do with uh, emergency management type situations. With that, if there were, if there are any report or any questions on the report, I'd be happy to to answer any questions. Any comments or questions? Seeing none. Okay. All in favor then, please. It's carried. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Corey. Thank Your you. Worship. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's he's gone again. Hey, Tom has lost video, I believe, but I believe. Oh, he's he lost video. Be. Sorry, Tom. I just I just come back. I don't have any video, but I have sound and I can see everyone else. Oh. It just went out all of a sudden. Okay, so did I did you have a question and we let Corey get away or? I just wanted you to realize that I'm I'm back uh, present. Okay. I can at least hear what's going on now. Okay, thanks, Tom. So our next one is a CIP uh, update, please. Yeah. Yep. The council adopts a bylaw to designate a community improvement project area. And further, the council adopts a bylaw to adopt the community improvement plan prepared by WSP. And further, the council appoints the community service branch as the administrator and as the review panel for the administration and monitoring of the CIP and its financial incentive programs. And further, the council directs the review panel in consultation with the Community Development Advisory Committee to bring forward recommendations to council with respect to financial incentive programs, marketing, and promotion of the CIP and annual review and monitoring of the programs. Okay, mover and seconder, please. Then Chris and uh, Robin. You're yeah. Uh, this is me. Uh, thank you, Mayor Stack and, and uh, members of council. Um, as you'll recall, we've been working on an update to our community improvement plan since September of last year. The process included uh, hiring a consultant who did a review of our uh, previous CIP, uh, did some um, consultation with both um, members of the public as well as business owners in our downtown through surveys. We um, presented at a public meeting in January for a uh, comment on the final draft uh, and have um, put together um, you know, a solid CIP that recognizes the needs of our community. Tonight's report um, asks council to do a couple of things um, and I'll go through those just briefly for council so, uh, and the public to understand what's happening. So with a CIP, um, councils often adopt a sec separate bylaw to deal with the CIP areas themselves. And this allows us to be flexible should council at any point want to change uh, the properties or, or type of property that is um, uh, subject to or uh, that CIPs are available to without opening up the CIP bylaw itself and having to go through another update process. Our, our previous CIP, as council will recall, included five different precincts. These areas um, were sort of geographically located, um, one being the downtown, for example, another dealing with the um, major thoroughfares of Mattawasa and Daniel Street, for, for example. So it really broke the town into a couple of different areas. The problem was that um, it may have segregated us a little bit too much into who could apply for um, grants, um, as opposed to maybe somebody who was designated the same way in the zoning bylaw should have the same rights um, of opportunity to apply. So the new um, draft recommends that the entire town be designated as the community improvement area so that we could touch on any area of town within the, um, within the town uh, 
depending on the incentive itself. So for each of the incentives now, you have criteria that determine whether or not the uh, incentive program would apply to you. Most of the uh, incentives apply only to commercial properties, which is um, you know, not unusual for a community improvement plan. Uh, there are a couple that would not rely necessarily on the property being designated commercial, but for example, the heritage uh, incentive uh, guideline or program grant would only apply to lands that are designated as heritage. Um, Brownfields, for example, were very um, restricted in the original plan to a specific pre precinct, um, but we recognize that there are other lands within the town that do have um, brownfields that may have been, for example, designated residential, uh, and they weren't included in the area and therefore um, could not apply for the brownfield incentive program. So we're looking more at um, the appropriate land use and uh, the type of incentive rather than uh, specific precincts that were a little bit more limited. Our, in our previous plan. Uh, so that sort of deals with um, adopting the CIP. So that would be the second bylaw would just adopt the actual plan. This, the uh, third recommendation is to report to appoint the review panel and administrator. So the plan does require a review panel to be designated to administer and monitor the plan and the financial incentive programs, as well as an administrator, which can be one or two members of the review panel. In addition to administering the financial incentive programs, um, uh, uh, suggested that it's been suggested that immediately following the adoption of the CIP, the review panel led by the administrator would undertake plan monitoring and evaluate um, the activities on an annual basis. The current CIP, Council Recall, um, had appointed the Community Development Advisory Committee as the review panel and the Marketing and Economic Development Officer as the administrator. But this uh, caused several issues to arise. Typically, when an application would come in, um, the community services branch, being the um, economic development officer, planner, and CBO, would pre with the applicant to make sure that they were meeting the criteria and uh, had a full application. And then once the application was received, write a report to CDAC for uh, recommendation to council on the application. The problem, uh, similar to the last report you just heard, is that the CDAC meets quarterly. Uh, and at, at some point hasn't met um, during the year uh, as a result of COVID or, or this year because of the election, we have limited meetings. Um, and as a result, frequently the community services branch was um, making direct re recommendations to council uh, to ensure that, that the process as intended was timely and reduce the bureaucracy and, um, and make sure that the uh, availability of the incentives for improvements was um, impactful for the developer that's, that was trying to make use of them. Like Planning Act applications for rezoning or a site plan, for example, staff directly report to council on those matters um, rather than going to CDAC because it's just not timely, first of all. And secondly, um, CDAC is used more for um, policy decisions and that kind of thing and recommendations to council. So at this time, um, for this CIP, staff is suggesting that council consider appointing the community services branch as the administrator and review panel for the applications themselves. And then in terms of, uh, um, in the terms of reference for the CDAC, it does say that uh, staff will consult on all policy matters, such as plans and programs uh, with recommendations to council. So the um, community services branch would uh, go to CDAC to get input on which financial incentive council should be considering this year, for example, uh, if, uh, feedback on how we market and, and uh, promote the plan, that kind of thing, and really use CDAC as the a policy um, a policy sounding board for, for matters uh, related to the plan rather than individual applications. And then the review panel, um, as I said, would, uh, would deal with the applications and bring them directly to council for consideration. Um, as we did with the previous CIP, uh, I think it's important to uh, bring forward a report to, to CDAC and council with recommendations on which of the programs specifically within our CIP that we should be promoting and, um, and working towards over the next uh, next few years at the least. Um, but that's the kind of thing we would go now to CDAC and get feedback on and bring back to council for consideration. Um, so that's that's basically the outline of the report and have to answer any questions uh, council has. And those bylaws are on the agenda for consideration this evening for council. Okay, comments or questions from council? Dan? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to Robin, I'm glad to see that the uh, people who did the report 
have uh, recognized that the one contractor is now two contractors for bids. I remember the last one was a one and it got passed, but anyways, they took it into, uh, into their account and that I'm happy with. Mm -hmm. So to sum up, the CDAC committee will not see an application that goes to the review board. Review board makes the decision. Where in the past it used to go to CDAC, right? Um, the review board will not make the decision, but they will uh, bring that uh, application to council, just like I do for a zoning amendment. It will be brought forward to council uh, for, for consideration. Similar in the past, just we, we always had that extra step of going to CDAC with each application as we could first, just added an extra layer that uh, that um, slowed down the process for, for the applicant to be able to, uh, to make use of the funds and, and get their projects going. We will still uh, bring policy matters to CDAC, but actual applications will come directly to council for consideration. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Chris? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I think this is a great idea, uh, Robin, just because you know one of the town's goals is to offer um, you know like superior customer service, and uh, you know part of that is um, I suppose getting getting someone the answers or the approvals as quick as possible. So I think this is uh, the step in the right direction for sure. So good job. Okay. Anyone else? I just wanted to bring up the one point, Robin, that you and I talked about just to clarify. So the whole town, any commercial merchants has an, an opportunity to apply here. And my question at the time, just for the rest of council's benefit was, we have almost 20 small retailers who rent space in the mall and they have very high overheads in that mall, you know, and they pay for their own signage and all of that stuff. So I just wanted to be sure that they were, had a, had a pathway to this opportunity as well. Okay. That's right. Okay, all in favor then, please. In favor. Thank you. The next one is the council remuneration uh, package for 2021 summary or other for 2021. The council receives as information the attached 2021 statement of remuneration and expenses paid to council and local boards. Mover and seconder, please. Lynn, Lisa, and I guess Jennifer, you're up. Jennifer. Uh, actually, the manager of finance, Jen Eve, is going to present a oh, report okay. today. Good. Good evening, everyone. To, two Jennifers now, I'll have to be careful how I fill that in. <laughs> Good evening. A requirement of the municipal act requires municipalities to provide an annual statement of remun remuneration expenses paid to council and local boards by March 31st. Attached to this report to the, of the 2021 statement of re remuneration expenses paid to council and local boards is Appendix A that summarizes, summarizes the salaries, benefits, and conferences and other expenses paid to each member of council and local boards for the 2021 year. Does anyone have any questions? Lynn? So just looking at the table, I'm a little confused with the conference and other expenses. Can you just outline what they are? Because I know that uh, conferences weren't a part of it just for people's sake, uh, sake of understanding. Yeah, so listed under the conferences and other expenses paid to council members, um, they include reimbursement for mileage, telephone, internet, uh, conferences, training, and per diems of out-of-town events. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? No? Okay, all in favor then, please. It's carried. Thank you. So we have... Uh, Four advisory committee reports. Scala, if we can do one at a time and the chairperson can uh, speak to them after we get a mover and seconder. Okay. So the first one that council received the community development advisory committee minutes of October 18th, 2021 as information. Mover and seconder, please. Lynn and Chris. Comment from the chair. Um. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that we were commenting. I didn't think that this was like a summary or anything. I just thought they were being entered for information. So I answer questions if anybody has any questions. Yeah, but it, yeah, we're having a, a motion on each one individually. So I just thought if you have any comments, it's time if you know the information 
is there in the report, so that's fine. Okay, uh, so all in favor then, please? It's carried. Thank you. Uh, second one, please, yeah. Yep. The council receive the Corporate Services Advisory Committee meeting minutes of November 1st, 2021 as information. Mover and seconder, please. Lisa and Ted. <clears throat> There's no chair here tonight anyways, right? So. Oh, Ted. Any, anybody want to make a comment on it? No? Okay. All in favor, please. It's carried. Thank you. And the third one. The council received the Inclusivity and Diversity Advisory Committee meeting minutes of December 2nd, um, 2021 as information. Okay, mover and seconder, please. Lynn, Chris, all in favor then? In favor. Great, thank you. And the last one? And the council received the Inclusivity and Diversity Advisory Committee meeting minutes of February 3rd, 2022 as information. Mover and seconder, please. Lynn, Lisa, all in favor? In favor. Carrie, okay. thank you. Mr. Mayor? Yeah. Yes, oh, Chris. Oh, I just want to make a comment on the last one there to uh, Councillor uh, Councilor, uh, Lynn and her team. Um, there's some really interesting like initiatives that you guys had brought forward. And I just want to uh, like, congratulate you and your team because some of the ideas uh, that you have um, mentioned, uh, they, they sound really exciting. I think it was the night, the night market or anyway, hopefully it can happen because it's, uh, it, looks, it looks really cool. So job well done to you and your team on that idea. Thank you. So if I can just say, um, Mayor Stein, uh, Graham helped a great deal with uh, um, that as well, because there was a grant that he was able to apply for. So keep those good thoughts, because if we don't get the grant, we're coming after council for money to make sure that that night market happens. <laughs> That's a warning, right? Yes. <laughs> good. Okay. Just if I could add, uh, Councillor Grinstead, um, maybe you wanted to add something about the uh, our survey that we have out. I was going to, and then Chris kind of got started with all. So there is a survey that is out right now. Um, unfortunately, just in monitoring some of the comments, I, there is some negative uh, pushback on it, but there's also some positive. But there is the survey. It's it's only meant to help. Um, get a feel for if there's anybody in the community that wants to share anything positive and or negative that we can help guide um, council, the community, all of the good stuff uh, as we move forward. Um, so um, it's hard to do these surveys because wording is one, you know, I'm such a I don't want to use the word simple, but for me, the word is the word. I don't look for negative meanings, but some people words do affect them negatively. So um, nothing was ever meant in any way, shape or form other than to just collect information to help us to move forward. Um, so the survey is out there. So hoping that everybody takes advantage and uh, definitely fills it in and uh, enters any feedback that they have for us so that we can um, get a big picture of how people are experiencing different situations. Okay. I uh, actually filled it in today, Lynn. Just the one observation I had, it was one question, I guess. It wasn't one an answer. It said required. I'm not so sure that's a good idea. People have different experiences and exposures. And, you know, you're kind of forced to, to plunk an answer in there somewhere. So I don't know. You know, so may, maybe that is one that we missed because I, I think we were very careful to make sure it was um, user friendly and, and so we yeah. might miss that. So maybe uh, maybe we'll have to look at that in um, CAO and clerk and make sure that it's not to offend people. Yeah, it's just that you know like it was one question might be two questions to somebody else. I don't know. And, Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, because not everybody. To, being forced to make an indication, I don't think is. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely correct. We missed that somehow. 
Okay, uh, now, Kayla, did, where were we? Need an all in favor here? Did we? Yeah, all in favor for this one. It's carried, thank you. We have no notice of motions. So Dan, county report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, one, the operations committee is recommending to the county council that a master traffic plan be created for the county and further recommendations within the report that it be budgeted for, not like the last one. So when this report is done, including culverts, bridges and roads, 2025, Madawaska is done, the budget's there and it's gonna be done. Two, the province on-site and excess soil management dealing with the Ontario Re Regulation 406-19 webcast was held on the 22nd of February has raised concerns in the county. As a result, the province coordinator will be hosting a special Zoom meeting with County Public Works who have in turn invited municip municipalities to join and John is on board. I'm just not sure if he's gonna be in attendance. Uh, one of the things was like on your county roads, we put salt down, the salt goes into the culvert and after years it gets saturated and they're gonna move or expand the road. So that salt is now contaminated or not contaminated somebody has to on the quality side has to say it's good and then you can throw it in the farmer's field and kill his field because of the salt uh three the housing if you're into the housing market we sold in 2021 19 for that month or this month i should say and in 2022 we sold 46 the sale price in 2021 was four hundred and seventy nine thousand and eighteen dollars and in 2022 it's five hundred and seventy five thousand three hundred and eight Another retirement, effective 31st of March, Colleen Sadler is a business consultant with the Renfrew County Enterprise, will retire after 20 years service. The Gypsy Moth, it's now called the Spongy Moth, will be back this year, and there's no spraying intended in the county. The Ontario government has provided a website entitled 511 Ontario that has the traffic cameras throughout the province that will give you a snapshot of the weather's road conditions. I'm not sure if everyone's aware of that, but it's got from Ottawa to North Bay and the big ones are in Foymont in our case. The curve on Baskin Drive West where we had that fatality last summer has now four solar powered warning lights installed on the beacons to warn drivers of the curb at no cost to the town. And a new company in town called Metalgia, not Metalia, the band, is located in the old Sandbeck building, is now in operation. County staff David Weibo and Alistair Baird have reached out to the owners about the county assistance. And I'll call upon the mayor at this time to expand on that. Um, he's been to the site as I, as I have, and I met the workers, but the, the mayor has met the boss. Okay, uh, thanks, Dan. I, uh, uh, like you said, last last week one day I spent about three hours with them out there uh, going over their product and their plans a bit and that, and uh, was planning to bring a, a report back and hopefully more uh, tied into the time when they were ready to provide a little bit more detail. They're almost there, but they're, uh, they got a little ways to go. But anyways, as I said in, in the earlier updates to Council, in January 2021, through a connection, I got a phone call. I went, took a drive to Ottawa, met this one principal who was involved. And, you know, he showed me some of their work in one of the residential houses they were doing. And basically their product is, is uh, the base to their product is galvanized steel that goes through a CNC uh, 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 roll forming process that bends the steel, but also notches it out, punches holes in it by a, a pre-programmed uh, uh, definition that's put in, depending on what they do. They do wall studying, uh, floor joists, uh, ceiling joists, all that stuff. And of course, there's extra strength in it, allows them to go higher uh, heights in, in construction, has uh, you know uh, the rheology, uh, one of the benefits is its longevity. And, and of course, the, uh, the fire protection, the rating for fire insurance, is an advantage of it, and they and they're studying. They build panels out of that as well that can can be used uh, in their product and has potential for more. <clears throat> they they had made inquiries at the time about the the Sandbeck building, but were were you know had some concerns that uh, a couple of ways that you know were voiced to me in terms of the size of it, also the environmental issue. 
I, I, I toured a, a very high-end home that was under construction. And I tell you, it had ceiling and floor joists in it that were like 16 to 18 inches in depth. And they had roll formed this uh, material to use for it. To give you an idea of the size of the home and, and the value of it, they, they, uh, in the garage, there was an elevator. When you go downstairs into the owner's office, now at this point, it's still bare studs, right? Under construction. One wall was all glass because the owner had a very expensive car and the elevator in the garage could lower his car. So when he was working, he could see it, right? But that all of this uh, structural product was used in that home and it was three stories high in, uh, in uh, and obviously a very expensive uh, home. When I came back, I talked with Robin and a couple of days later we met with Lindsay and uh, we asked Lindsay to, to make contact with the County Economic Group and I took on the, uh, the communication with MPP Yakabuski's office and, and uh, brought them together uh, on the environmental side. And I gotta say, uh, John and his team in, in Pembroke, especially Laurie in the office, uh, Laura was really, really helpful. And these guys will tell you that themselves in terms of helping them maneuver through the environmental issues and going. So they have a 10 year plan to completely remediate the site, but there's, there's a cost to that. Uh, they, you know, they, uh, they have it, they basically, their for sale product is a three season park model trailer that's, you know, on a set of wheels. They have a design and developed a four season one that will move into the housing market. And uh, when I was there last, uh, early last week, at the end of last week, they were having uh, some people in from the US who were looking at that product. Uh, theirs had to be under 400 square feet for whatever their their use was. Uh, the uh, the uh, model, the current design model, is 450 square feet, but uh, they've uh, they can work their redesign to meet that. So they were optimistic of some contract activity there. They also had representatives in last Friday from the Cree Nation who are looking at their four season model for some housing potential and. Uh, he, he uh, was talking to them on Thursday of this past week. It looks like they could have a contract there for 29 units, which would really give them a boost. They need help, and I've offered to sign letters of support for them, obviously for federal funding and provincial funding for purchase of equipment and, uh, and uh, some uh, technology support in, in the plant. I, uh, you know, as you know, I, I, I ran manufacturing plants, so I'm familiar with the, with the, uh, the process and the equipment, but their CNC fabricators are limited in size. And to get into this housing in a larger volume, they're going to need bigger uh, roll forming. And, uh, and those pieces of equipment there are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to the millions. So they're, uh, they're going to, they're going to work. They are working on that project, and we've offered to help anywhere we can. You know, uh, the uh, I think we have a couple pictures. Can we put them up to show? Uh, this is their. I'll keep talking while I go up, but they, this is their three model or three season uh, model park model, and there's a couple models there. It's about 450 square feet, and they come completely furnished. And they have a out of the plant cost of somewhere around 150,000. And you can see the uh, inside designs. What's interesting about them is they also use this galvanol steel in a pan forming process where they close the underneath of it. So there's no risk of rodent uh, infestation coming through the bottom or rot from the floors. I uh, camped in trailer parks for years with my kids. And when your trailers got oldest, the first thing that went was the floors in them, you know, so they've done that. And interesting enough, their plumbing design is continuous with no joints throughout the, uh, the operation. Now, obviously their kitchen washrooms are placed close together, showers and that sort of do it. And there's a place in the back of the trailer, if there's a problem with the plumbing, you can open it up and actually pull this continuous piece of plumbing out to the point where it needs a repair or whatever. And then there's a, a lead that allows them to pull it back through the system. So it's a really well thought out uh, uh, opportunity. And I think when you, you, know, you talk about affordable or as the provincial government is saying now, attainable housing, and you look at small houses as 
been you know talked about over the last few years there is some potential here and uh, and they have a, a lot of interest in it they really are optimistic and and uh, about the uh, the uh, demand what they did say to me that was encouraging being from manufacturing is that they're not prepared to risk the quality of their product for a volume output because they they think there could be a risk before they have all the equipment they need and and the uh, and the capacity to meet market demand may be a while. So they may have to control their, their supply uh, based on their, uh, their abil ability to produce at the quality they want to put out there, which was really good. Um, they have the plants big, as you all know. So they have extra office space and extra manufacturing space. And uh, they asked uh, about some help with that. And uh, they fully expect in within 18 to 24 months to be employing over 200, 200 to 200 plus employees in the plant. Right now there's between 15 and 20 people working and uh, it still looks kind of empty when you're in there because like you say, it is a big plant. But you know, from my view, I was very nervous and I don't mind saying really afraid that that site might sit empty for years because of the environmental issues around it. So. I think we're we're lucky, and uh, and I told these uh, gentlemen the same thing that uh, certainly appreciate the risks they're taking and the investment they're making in Ampere and with that site, and I think it can do nothing but good things for us uh, going forward. Uh, when they were talking about their space and that stuff last week, when I was at the mayor's breakfast, I talked to uh, to the attendees there about. Uh, you know, the potential of working and starting to work with some uh, uh, currently active and also retiree, retired uh, members of the industrial community uh, locally. And uh, shortly after that meeting, I got a call from a businessman in town who runs a company here and uh, wanted to be part of that. And he's going to be, that was on Wednesday. On Thursday, he did me an email introduction with a third party again, who's looking to come to Aaron Pryor and was looking for space and office and warehouse space. So I've now put those together with the guys at uh, Metal Igna. And, you know, I asked them both to keep me in the loop. So hopefully they'll, uh, they'll be able to do something together and uh, they'll use some of the space in that plant as well. So uh, it, I think it's nothing but good news for, for Empire. For sure. Okay, thank you. Anything else, Dan? Yes, uh, just to continue with your comment, uh, Mr. Mayor, we talked with uh, Dave, the production foreman today, and he, he like you say, he's got uh, 18 to 20 people working, but he's hoping to have uh, double that for the end of the month. He's looking for employees, and we told him to, you know, obviously it's called uh, the county and the workforce. And the other point was uh, with Lynn, a long time ago, we went to that uh, Eastern Ontario conference about tiny houses. And when I seen these and said, hey, we could have a community of these things. Unfortunately, they're only three season, as uh, the mayor has said, they're making a four season one, but it's um, definitely a one family thing. Uh, you walk to the doors, you've got your stove, fridge, microwave, dining room together with your living room, and then double beds for two, so you can have four kids, and then the master bedroom with the washroom off to the left. Outstanding piece of kit, and uh, it's on wheels. So, I mean, we can move to the community where they want to go and put it on whatever foundation. So we really look forward to seeing this uh, booming in the next year. And lastly, Mr. Mayor, is uh, pending county council approval. We've got an email today approved that the province has agreed to the dates February 2023 for the Ontario Winter Games in Renfrew County. Councillor Peter Emo is chairing the committee and supposed to put all the package together to come to a future county council meeting and we're off and running like we were supposed to do last year, but because of COVID was canceled. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thanks, Dan. Okay, next we have correspondence. Kayla, Kayla please. The correspondence package number I-22 March 05 be received as information and filed accordingly. Move and seconder, please. Yes. Dan and Lynn, comments? Dan? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There's a couple. On page five, good news for delivery persons. The Ontario government will introduce the Working for Workers Act 2022 that would, if passed, establish foundational rights and protections for digital platform workers 
who provide rideshare delivery or courier services. This would guarantee them a minimum wage and the protection of their tips. On page 16, the Ontario government is investing in $6 million in the Seniors Community Grant Program for 22-23 for senior-based projects that help Ontario seniors stay safe, healthy, active, and connected to families and friends in their communities. Applications are now opened up until April 28, 2022 at ontario.ca get funding. So the question I'm hoping that our economic development officer with our Arm Prayer webpage can flash this up to all our senior people that they can make applications for. Uh, page 23 is uh, know someone who is homeless. April 1st, and it's not a joke apparently, 2022 is the date the Homelessness Prevention Program is being launched, which combines three programs, Community Homeless Prevention, Home for the Good, and Strong Communities, Rent Supplement Program. Access to this funding will be based on having a place by name list that meets the provincial requirements and contains detailed up-to-date information from individuals experiencing homelessness to help them to connect to local supports. So one phone call as a homelessness person, you, you should be on your way. On page 71, the Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force result in that more growth is pushing past urban boundaries and turning farmland into housing. Undeveloped land inside and outside existing municipal boundaries must be part of the solution, particularly in northern and rural communities, but isn't nearly enough on its own. Most of the solution must come from densification. Sound familiar? Exist, existing provincial lands could be used to assist affordable housing. So to the CAO, do we have any provincial property that could be developed for affordable housing? Um, before you answer that, see, I was thinking the land beside uh, the prior sports bar is provincial land and something on Baskin Drive where Shields refrigeration used to be way back when. Is that not provincial? Um, the brownfields and we can't do nothing with them? Um, the Shields property is actually up for tax sale right now, so we'll have to see on that one. Um, you're right, the land by the highway, there is some provincial land there. Um, whether it would be uh, suitable for, for housing, I'm not sure. Um, I, I can't think of any other provincially owned properties within the town that are vacant. Thank you. On page 105, uh, this was mentioned in the county report, but worth mentioning again, the summer company's applications are open. Re-election students age 15 to 29 who are looking to start a summer business can apply for the summer company funding. The program provides up to $3,000 in funding plus advice mentorship from local business. The program is open until May 31st, 2022. Page 106, uh, not sure what federal employee makes a minimum wage, but effective April 1st, 2022, the federal minimum wage will rise to $15.80 per hour. Approximately 26,000 federal employees work for this minimum wage. On page 112, AMO and LAS are excited to host a virtual municipal energy symposium March 31st to April 1st. The leading edge takes a critical look at the intersection of climate change land, uh, planning energy post COPA. So talking to the CEO, I was asking if we had anybody selected to go on the symposium and the answer is yes. So good, good news will We'll see where we're going to go with this climate control because, you know, a couple of weeks ago we had uh, JJ make a presentation. All good. Uh, on page 12, as municipalities move from paper to electronic filing, authentication of these files is a critical challenge. On 23rd of March, 9 till 10, join AMO's partner, Notorious, and learn how consigned cloud can greatly reduce the signing of documents, allow anyone to sign legally reliable documents electronically with a phone, tablet, or computer to the CAO. Would this training be beneficial to our staff? Uh, I think it, um, it is a product demonstration that we, um, we might uh, try and avail ourselves of for sure. We haven't really had any issues with electronic document signing uh, so far, but, uh, but we're interested in seeing what they have to offer. Thank you. On page 113 is uh, the Craft Hockeyville Grant Prize Community winner will have an opportunity to host an NHL preseason game and receive $250,000 for arena upgrades. Uh, 
and then we have two of them. This year's winner and each of the three runner-up communities will receive $10,000 to purchase new hockey equipment for their minor hockey programs. And the question was to the manager, manager of recreation, do we have any teams that could be eligible to enter this competition? I spoke to the manager today and he will be uh, looking uh, at possibilities with the minor hockey associations we have here in town to see if we can put together a submission. Thank you. And page 116, LAS is excited to offer once again custom energy training workshops in person from climate resiliency and net zero emissions to recommissioning and wastewater treatment plants. That was the key, the wastewater treatment plant. And we've got a workshop for every need. To the CEO, are there any plans to have a staff member attend these workshops? Um, yeah, we we are uh, reviewing some of these available workshops to determine if there are any that we can attend and, uh, and we'll certainly take advantage of those if we can. And that's it, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Okay. Anything else? Okay. All in favor then, please? Carried. And the next one, Kayla? The correspondence package number A22 March 02 be received and the recommendations be brought forward for council consideration. Mover and seconder, please. Dan and Lynn, any comments? All in favor? Carry. Thank you. So, bylaws uh, and uh, resolutions. Okay. We have four bylaws, eh? So, we're we going to do them all at once tonight. Is anybody? Yeah. Okay, Kayla, yeah, all of them. Okay. The following bylaws be and are hereby enacted and passed. Bylaw 727222, Restructure Emergency Management Planning Committee. Bylaw 727322, Contribution Agreement for Funding under the Canada Community Revitalization Fund. Bylaw 727422, Designate a Community Improvement Project Area. And Bylaw 727522, Adopt Community Improvement Plan. Movers and seconder, please. Chris and Lynn, comments? All in favor? Carried, thank you. And we have one resolution. Uh, maybe we could read this resolution out too, Kayla. Yep. Whereas the Council of the Corporation of the Town of Empire supports our federal, provincial, and local municipalities in condemning the aggression and violent acts that Russia is taking upon Ukraine. And whereas on March 2nd, 2022, Mayor Stock issued a press release voicing the town's support of the Ukrainian people who are fighting bravely against the invading Russian forces and asked that everyone in Armpar keep these brave souls in our hearts and minds and hope for a swift end to this conflict. And whereas the clock at the DA Gillies Museum will stay lit in blue and yellow until the attack cease. Therefore, be it resolved that the council support the humanitarian efforts in Ukraine with a thousand dollar donation to the Canadian Red Cross Ukrainian Human Humanitarian Crisis Appeal, and that the mayor send a letter to the Ukrainian embassy in Ottawa to, in support and solidarity of those in Ukraine, their friends and families across the globe, and those of Ukrainian heritage within our community. Mover and seconder, please. Yes. And Chris. Okay, just a first comment. First of all, thanks, Lynn, for bringing this forward. I mean, we've all been watching this on TV, and I mean, it's just hard to believe that, that what's happening is happening. I was watching some more of it again uh, before I came in tonight, and uh, it's just really unfortunate in, in, in today's world that a dictator can do and, and relish so much pain on a whole nation. And, you know, when you look at those people that are packing little suitcases and carrying their kids, and walking for miles to try and get out of that country, a country that was just, you know, progressive, living its own life, bothering nobody, and, and certainly didn't do anything to bring this curse of, uh, of devastation down on them. So I'm really glad we're doing this tonight, and, uh, and uh, I'd be more than happy to sign a letter and send it out. Any other comments? Lynn? Yeah. Often we get letters from other municipalities doing things and kind of challenging or, off, you know, uh, appealing to uh, join in. And I just think that if there's an easy way to do that, that maybe we should be sharing this with other municipalities and, you know, um, plea, not plea, what's the word, 
ask them if they would join it because you just think of all the municipalities that even in our district, if everybody gave $1,000 to the Red Cross, what that would do for um, the Ukrainians afterwards. It's a good idea. I suppose we could send it to them as information and, and ask them to give it some consideration just yeah. to, as a send off, but we can't really, you know, speak for other municipalities. No, for, yeah, for sure not. But, and and but, asking but, if they're interested in considering it then, yeah. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Just what we had in the uh, action package of our correspondence where we, we send out a, letter, a formal letter to all the municipalities asking for support, and this is what we've done, and if they'd like to follow, then that's all good. That's exactly what we're saying, yeah. And the, second part, Mr. Mr. the second part, without mentioning names, Mr. Mayor, we've got uh, at least one business person here that's got a cousins over there that he's really um, um, afraid, I guess we'll say, in, yeah. in that... Uh, I'm sure you know who it is, but yeah. just that our, our heartfelt uh, sympathies and all the good stuff, and we're certainly hoping it, it fares better. Thank you. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, so all in favor then, please? It's carried, thank you. Announcements. Dan, yeah. About 50 years ago, give or take, I used to be a broomball player, so I volunteered for the broomball this weekend. So it's uh, on behalf of town council and the business community and residents, we convey our thanks to Ruth and George Brown and all volunteers for bringing the 44th annual broomball championships back to Armpire. There were 42 teams all together from across Ontario. The furthest team east was Van Cleek Hill and as far west as Windsor. And the winter winners are elite men from Lacombe, or their name Lacombe, and they're from Maxville. Elite women, the Rebels from Russell, Finch, and Maxville. The intermediate men's as Cyclones from Seaforth. Intermediate ladies, Rapage from Blythe. Men's masters, EOQ Legends from Maxville. Master ladies, Wicked Ice from Innisville and Barrie. And in the co-ed division, the rough edge from Grafton. To go along with that, uh, Mr. Mayor, I received an email from Ruth to which I'd like to read. Quote, please convey to the town of Armpire for their generous donation, their welcoming to our participants and their families. The very generous support from your business community, hotels, restaurants, senior association volunteers, our refs, Nick Smith, center staff, and especially our Broomball Committee group and juvenile program and Glenn Arthur's gang of timekeepers and runner-ups. We couldn't have pulled off this enormous success without all of them. People were just so happy to be out seeing friends again, watching good broomball and sharing stories. It was a wonderful weekend. As well, great support from the Renfrew County paramedics and the broomball nursing and fireman fans that assisted in two calls. The parking restrictions for the size of the crowd is an issue requiring a solution for alternate parking arrangements. Thanks again, and we'll certainly accept your offer to volunteer for another one for in the future. So that was the broom ball, guys. Uh, downtown Armpire, Elgin Street is changing. Uh, you know, I get down there occasionally, but not all the time. Elgin Street, two, there's the new or relocated business in Elgin Street, all the best. They include Armpire Gallery, Curly's, which is a hairdressing establishment. Next door is the, and you want a coffee, it's the Ottawa Valley Coffee, which hosts craft beer and, and a local market. And on the Heritage Mall behind CIBC, you've got the Valley Vino, which has moved from Madawaska. Zesty Shwarma, which moved from across or beside Tiny Treasures. Lincoln May Interior, and of course, the Chicken Palace. Armpire Chase the Ace is supposed to be up running tomorrow. That's the hospital one. Uh, the bad news, Lions Chase the Ace is over. It was won by Connie Piaski. 13,605 no, $13, dollars The profits from this draw are going to the seniors at home and neighborhood link. And the next one's going to go towards Larsh. Uh, I wish everyone a uh, St. Patrick's Day. And I know my mom at my brother's probably watching this. So, and from my mom, Doris Lynch, 
Thanks, Council, for your sincere sincere birthday wishes on her heart birthday. Bye. <laughs> a hundred's a bit of a milestone. You'll soon be there, Dan. So. Okay. Um, I stuck my head into the broom ball this weekend just for a bit, too, and I couldn't help but think a couple of years ago on March 13th and Friday, we were at the fire hall and uh, the first uh, emergency committee meeting on the pandemic. When it was over, we had to send Graham up to the next Smith Center to send some 1,500, 13, 1,500 broom ball players home, you know, and, uh, I, you know, I chatted with Robin about it before and I said I felt so bad for Graham that day because I didn't know just what kind of reaction he would, uh, would get with it so two years later but great to see it on again and uh, and uh, you know it's like the, the mayor's breakfast not you know as big a crowd as I'm sure the chamber hoped for but nice to be meeting in in person again and doing that you know the other thing Dan in terms of your store though in my presentation last week at the uh, mayor's breakfast we have 90 storefronts in the downtown with one vacancy. It's been a long time since Harper has been in that mm -hmm. situation. And uh, in the last two weeks, talked to two or three different people who are looking for a place in the downtown. And as recently as this afternoon, I got a phone call from a gentleman from Regina, who's Saskatchewan, who's looking at buying a retail business in downtown Ironpire and uh, and wanted to know about the community and its growth and things that are going on. He's in Toronto and going to be here this weekend. So I've offered to, to give him a tour on Saturday or Sunday and uh, take him around and show him the town in detail. So, uh, you know, the formula is working. Anybody else? Chris, yet? Yeah? Oh, thank you. Oh, I just want to uh, let people know that uh, some. Uh, some wonderful things are happening at the Arn Prior and District Museum. Uh, they are hosting what they call the Museum Speaker Series, which is presented by the Arn Prior Historical Society. And this upcoming Friday, March 18th, they have a guest speaker called Dennis Mills, who will be talking about uh, the title is Uncovering the Value of the 19th Century Handwoven Textile Industry. And a couple of weeks ago, I attended uh, virtually, they had um, uh, a presentation on the Blue Nose, the Blue Nose architect, William James Rui, and uh, they had the original handwritten design. Uh, now, I'm just going to say some of these maybe presentations you may not think sound too interesting, but I'll tell you after uh, attending the last one, I, um, you know, honestly, I was blown away by some of the expertise that these people have and they, they, um, they bring you to places that you never even thought uh, kind of existed and what people do. So I think it's worth, it's worth um, looking into. Anyway, you can check it out at the Armprime District Museum Facebook page and uh, register. This one will be in person. So anyway, if you're looking for something to do, uh, the Museum Speaker Series is a wonderful place to start. So thanks for the time. Good. Anyone else? I'll just, uh, one I did forget, in the last week, I... Uh, Wednesday and Thursday, I attended two Zoom meetings with OPG on the spring fajette and preparation for flooding this year. And, uh, you know, the bottom line is here that the, the things look really, really good. Shouldn't have any other, any real concerns about flooding. The one qualifying uh, statement that was made, that's the way it looked in 2017, because they cannot forecast the spring rains. And in 2017, the extraordinary rainfall was what led us into the first flood problem. So, you know, barring any real change, dramatic change, and they said until the rains come, they don't know, OPG doesn't have any uh, crystal ball either, so they don't know what that volume is going to be. But it actually, you know, the water is low right now. The, the, uh, the melt-off, they don't expect any serious problems with. So keep our fingers crossed and we should be okay. And there were two meetings because one was on the Ottawa River and the other was on the Madawaska. 
Okay. So do we have any media questions? I do not have any hands raised. Okay. And we have no closed sessions. We need a conformatory bylaw. That bylaw 727622 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the regular meeting and council held on March 14th, 2022 be and is hereby enacted and passed. Mover and seconder, please. Lynn and Dan, all in favor? Carried. An adjournment, please. Council, Lee. go ahead. Somebody needs to raise that. Ted, thank you. Okay. All in favor? Adjourned. Thank you all again for a big night.